senior year of high school, two of my best friends and I, we, we took a trip up to Wisconsin before we all went off to college. One of my friend's grandparents owned a cabin on a beautiful lake way up in the northern part of the state. We had a blast that week. We, we fished, we water skied, we went hiking, and it was such a great time. Because we wanted to squeeze every last drop out of that week before we had to head back home, we decided to spend the entire last day out on that lake and then start to drive home later that evening. Now this meant that we would have to drive home through the night. Now we would get home really early the next morning. The drive was ridiculous. I want to say it was like 12 hours or something, but there were three of us. And we decided we would all take shifts with one guy sleeping, one guy driving, and the other guy making sure that the driver stayed awake. When we started the trip back home around like seven or eight o'clock at night, I took the first shift and one of the guys said he felt like he could you know, go ahead and, and grab a nap so he would be ready to go a bit later. Well, eight hours later, that joker was still sleeping. And as hard as we tried, we couldn't get him to wake up. And believe you me, two college age guys on a road trip can think of some pretty creative ways to try and wake somebody up. And when he finally did wake up, it was, it was really early the next morning. And of course he felt horrible for sleeping all through the night because he was you know, feeling quite rested and we were exhausted, he said that he could finish the drive and we could both get some sleep. And so while Sleeping Beauty went into a gas station to get some coffee, we both fell right to sleep. Now, now I happen to be you know, a fairly large guy, which means I don't get along very well with tight spaces. I managed to sleep for a couple of hours before I woke up, and, which in this case is a really good thing because when I did wake up, I discovered that my friend had been driving the entire time in the wrong direction. I mean, two hours, two hours in the wrong direction. We never let him live that one down. I don't think he ever drove again on any of our road trips. You see, we can be right on track when it comes to our intended destination, but then all out of whack when it comes to our current direction. My sleeping friend had every intention of getting us home. I mean, the only problem was his direction was all wrong. See, where we want to go and where we presently are headed, they're not always the same thing. The author of 2 Peter makes it clear right from the beginning of the passage that we've been called, we've been equipped, and now we are expected to be moving forward. In verse 3, we're told that God's divine power has given us everything we need to live a godly life. I mean, just to be sure, that, that word for everything literally means everything. Everything we need to live a life of forward movement, we already have. I really like how, how he puts it in verse 4. The author says that, that through God's precious promises, you and I may participate in the divine nature. I mean, it's clear that this author has a great deal of confidence when it comes to the quality of life and the depth of character that is possible for a disciple of Jesus Christ. However, we've already admitted that we have a maturity gap, right? There's this distance between our ideal and our real, right? Between who we, who we currently are and who we know we could be. So the question becomes, how do we close the gap? I mean, how do we move forward? Let's go back to 2 Peter. In verse 5, the author says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Faith, my friends, is where a life of forward movement begins. I mean, faith is what opens the door to all of the other virtues that come next in the passage. I mean, the author knows that apart from a faith that is rooted and grounded in the truth of who Jesus has revealed God to be and what God has accomplished through Jesus, these virtues, I mean, a life of forward movement is nothing more than a pipe dream. You see, faith opens the door to a really beautiful life. In verse 5, the author says to us, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. The word for goodness in the original language of the New Testament is the ancient Greek word arete. In Greek thought, arete was known as the golden mean, and it was the most prized virtue of all Greek thought and the goal of all Greek education. I mean, bottom line, arete is as good as it gets. I mean, it's life in perfect balance. It's humanity running on all cylinders. I mean, this is where it all begins. I would argue that one of the biggest reasons why 
many of us struggle to experience the reality of our salvation, to move forward. It isn't because we don't have a big enough sense of who God is, but instead it's because we don't have a big enough sense of who God thinks we can be. It's not that we don't have a high enough view of divinity, it's that we have too low a view of humanity. It's interesting that, that more often than not, when Jesus heals somebody, you know, you know what he says to them right after? He says to them, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. In fact, one of my favorite encounters with Jesus happens in Mark chapter five. Jesus is, is surrounded by this huge crowd of people. And there, there's this woman who we are told has been subject to bleeding for 12 years. And she's exhausted all of her resources in trying to find a remedy. And instead of getting better, she got worse. But she's heard of this Jesus. And she knows that if she can just touch the edge of his cloak, that she could be healed. And so she works her way through the crowd and she's able to, to reach out and touch just the edge of his cloak and immediately she is healed. I mean, the sickness is taken away. And Jesus knows that something has happened. And so he stops and he asks, who touched me? The disciples think he's crazy because I mean, he's surrounded by, by this huge crowd, all these people everywhere. And he wants to know who touched him. I mean, um, Jesus, that would be like everybody. But you see, Jesus knows that, that something even more profound needs to happen than a physical healing. And eventually, the woman realizes that Jesus isn't going to, to let her sneak away. And so she comes up to Jesus. She falls at his feet. And he says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Now, my question is, why did Jesus do that? I mean, if all that mattered was that she understood that Jesus was the source of her healing, right? That she was busted and broken and couldn't fix herself. If, if her knowing that was all that really mattered, then Jesus could have just let her sneak away. Because let's be honest, that's obvious. See, there was something else she needed to know. Jesus went out of his way to make sure that she knew her faith was involved and what had just happened. I mean, this was an act of empowerment on Jesus' part. He wanted her to know that when her faith connected with his power, unbelievable things could happen. I believe Jesus wants you to know the same thing. And when your faith is combined with God's saving love, it has the potential to accomplish unbelievable things. It's important to not read into this too much. I mean, it doesn't mean that every time a prayer isn't answered or a healing doesn't happen, that we have a lack of faith. To be honest, it's a mystery. But the one thing that we can take away from this is that through the saving love of God, Jesus believes that we can live a really beautiful life. Now, there are two questions that we need to ask ourselves in light of this. And the first one is simply, do you want this? That may seem like a, a really silly question, but the truth is, even though there is this beautiful kind of life offered to us in the gospel, we often settle for less, don't we? Perhaps that's a helpful way for us to think about what sin is. It's all the ways we settle for less than what God wants for us. So perhaps how you need to begin your journey forward is with a bit of confession. In what ways have you settled for less than God's own goodness? Less than a rete. You put a name to your maturity gap. What is it that is separating your ideal from your real? The second question is just as important. It goes like this. Do you believe it? Do you truly believe that it is possible for you to experience a right day, to be changed into the likeness of Christ, to share God's own nature? Because it's so easy to allow those voices of guilt, those voices of condemnation to drown out the voice of God, isn't it? My son, Rowan, he loves to draw. It's one of his, one of his very favorite things to do, but he doesn't like doing it by himself. He always wants daddy to draw with him. And so he'll hand me a blank piece of paper and a marker and I'll say, here, Daddy, draw with me. Because in his mind, I can do anything. He usually asks me to draw something really difficult, really complicated, like, like Optimus Prime or something, you know? Now, now, there are a couple of things that, that I know I can draw. And so instead, I usually just try to talk him into like letting me draw one of those instead. But that little guy, 
He's persistent. He's really cute too. But it's funny how differently though, we, we, we both see that blank piece of paper. When my son looks at that paper, all he sees is possibility. He sees all the things that it could be, not me. To me, that, that blank piece of paper is actually quite intimidating. When I look at it, I, I don't see possibility. I, I see limitations. I don't look at it through the lens of what it could be. I look at it through the lens of what it can't be. When you look at your life, what do you see? Do you see limitations or do you see possibilities? What have you given up on? What is that thing that you say can't or won't happen? Perhaps what you need to do here as we begin is to ask God to give you the strength to reimagine these things in light of the hope that we have in Jesus. That in Jesus, all things are possible to those who believe.